what do you spend in a year? What do you make in a year? What are your assets? What do you own? What are the different types of assets that you own? And, you know, specifically what I see is, especially as people uh, earn more money, they start to lose track of how much they actually spend. Hey, y'all, this is Costa. And today I'm here with my guest, Scott Reinhardt, CPA, financial planner and founder of Verify Financial, a resource to help DIY investors spend purposefully, pay less in tax and invest wisely. Today, we're talking about taxes, deductions and everything caregivers should know. Scott, for so many of us, caregiving is a full-time job. We start with no training or notice. From a financial perspective, what should families expect and generally prepare for? Yeah, and uh, thank you so much for having me on today. And I think the thing that happens so often is you get thrown into caregiving, and all of a sudden, that's a big-time commitment, which means you are spending more and more time away from work if you, if, you know, if you work. So all of a sudden you're using up all of your sick days, you're using up your vacation days and you're not getting to spend time doing what you want to on the vacation. So, uh, you know, beyond a financial perspective, like there's that mental, uh, load that starts to add on top of, on top of it all, which is potentially going to hurt your performance at work. Unfortunately, I've seen this um, a few times where a client starts helping their parents um, almost full time and all of a sudden they're starting to feel pressure at work because, you know, they're just not quite maybe working full time. So a few states are starting to give some leave for that called paid family leave. Now it's not very many right now. It's 13 states, I believe. Um, and it, by the way, this is different from, you know, the family medical leave act that's at the federal level. That one guarantees that you're not going to lose your job, that you're not going to lose your benefits for up to 12 weeks. That's separate. Paid family leave is actually, you can start to, you can actually receive some of your pay without losing your job and without giving up benefits. So That's something to check out um, for your listeners to see if they're in a state that does that. But then the other thing is that potentially if you have to just go full-time caregiver, you might have to quit work early, which might delay your family. If you have a spouse, might delay your retirement a bit. And I've actually seen it, you know, it's not just from a financial perspective. Maybe you don't hit your number quite as quick. But it's also just from a uh, behavioral perspective a little bit, because I've seen where one spouse, her parents are needing care. So she is spending all of her time caring for them for the most part. The husband, even though they have enough to retire, he could walk away. They would be fine. They're good to go. He's not doing it because if he retires, he's kind of going to be spending his days alone, not doing things he wants to. So, um, I think the thing to just be prepared for is that if you are going to be kind of a full-time caregiver, um, be prepared that delaying retirement might be in the cards and, uh, just be ready to take on that reality, I guess. And you have a strong focus on tax planning for retirement. Can you explain why this is such a crucial area for families and caregivers to understand? Absolutely. So tax planning, it it may honestly not be the most important aspect Mm -hmm. of retirement planning. Um, You know, I think investment planning and cash flow planning, insurance planning, those things are, you know, the sexy ones. They're at the top of the list. But tax planning is the one that I think is underutilized under discussed Mm -hmm. and it's something that can make a huge difference. Now the goal of tax planning, and by the way, I want to clarify the difference between tax planning and tax preparation. I actually don't do, I'm a CPA, but I don't do tax preparation. I don't do anybody's taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, Tax preparation is more about looking in history. You're a historian looking at the past, making sure we file our taxes correctly so that we Mm -hmm. get the 
IRS on good terms with us. Sure. Tax planning is about projecting in the short term, midterm, and long term. How do I decrease my lifetime taxes as best I can? Um, and the way to do that is not necessarily to avoid all taxes. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. But how do I just get Uncle Sam and my state to take the least percentage that I can reasonably do? And what I see a lot is that as people approach retirement, they have these different accounts that they have um, accumulated. So they might have a brokerage account at one investment firm. Then they have their 401ks or 403bs. And that's money that they haven't paid taxes on yet. So mm-hmm. when they pull that out, as they start to need it to draw income in retirement, finding the right mix of, hey, let's pull from this source, let's pull from that source next, finding the right mix over the short term, midterm, and long term to just try and decrease um, the lifetime tax bill. Because one thing that some retirees have to worry about is kind of you, you hear it called a tax bomb. That's a little bit dramatic, but but what can happen is let's say you are a pretty frugal person and you live you retire and you live on mostly social security and maybe a small pension. Pensions are you know almost That's by the wayside at this point. Past, yes, yes, they are. I didn't know those uh, existed still. <laughs> oh man, basically government workers might be the yeah, the, the right. holdouts. Yeah. Um, you know, a small pension maybe, and then maybe just from time to time as needed, like for a vacation or a house project, then they pull from the investments. You know, this is someone that's usually spending less than $100,000 a year if they're mm-hmm. married. Sure. What, what can happen is, let's say they have a 401k, and they mm-hmm. just kind of let that ride for the most part in retirement. And they go in their 60s and up into their early 70s. And maybe they pay very little tax because Social Security, the way it's taxed, is it you have to have other income to layer on right. top of it before it becomes taxable. Okay. And so they go all these years and maybe they don't even file a tax return because they don't need to. Yeah. You know, your first, I'm going to, I'm going to round up. I'm not going to use exact numbers. Maybe your first $30,000 because of the standard deduction is totally tax free, right? Wow. That's your first standard deduction. Yeah. And then if social security, if it isn't all taxable, then it's tax free. Right. So they go all these years thinking, man, retirement's great. I pay like nothing in tax. But then they have this 401k that has been building and building and building. And maybe it's reached a balance of a million or two million. I'm going to say $2 million. It's reached yeah. a balance of $2 million. They're age 75. And now the IRS says you are required. It's called a required minimum distribution. You are required to start drawing money out of it and start paying some taxes. So now, and this is a rough number. Now they have to pull $80,000 out of that IRA or 401k, mm-hmm. which adds to their taxable income, which causes their social security to be almost fully taxable, about 85%. And so all of a sudden they're reaching, they go from like a zero or 10 or 12% tax bracket to a 22 or even a 24 plus percent tax bracket. And they, so it's, so that income is taxed at a, or that 401k is taxed at the income tax rate. That's right. It's taxed at your ordinary tax rate. You know, other investments, investments outside of a 401k or an IRA, you're only taxed on the capital gains. Exactly. And it gets favorable tax treatment. Either zero percent right. if you're under a certain threshold, which I love that tax rate, or fifteen yeah. percent, um, and so then some folks get up to twenty. When you when you're talking to individuals who are planning for retirement and they're doing the tax planning, what do you tell them to do if they have money in a four hundred one k or an IRA and they have that social security or pension? Do you tell them to take it when realize the income at the beginning, or do you tell them is there like a sweet spot when they should? actually say, okay, there's my $400,000 in the 401k. 
Yep. So the sweet spot is figuring out how much can I take today, whether yeah. that's taking it as income or doing Roth conversions, okay. converting money to a Roth. So a Roth is different in that you pay tax when you right. do that, right. but now it goes in the Roth and it grows tax free right. and there's no required distributions on it. Um, and so how do you smooth out your income throughout retirement? How do you smooth out your overall tax rates so that, hey, if I can project out and see that you're going to bump up into this much higher tax bracket when, you know, later on. When you have to realize then, it. Yeah. yeah, when you have to realize it. How do we realize some of it today at a lower tax rate so that throughout retirement, our tax rate stays a little bit more steady um, without bumping up, you know, instead of having this a few years with a very low one and feeling kind of falsely good about it. Yeah. And then having this huge bump up for from age 75 until age 90 or basically as long as you live. Yeah. So let's talk about tax deductions that caregivers might not be aware of. Can you give us an overview of the key deductions that we should keep in mind? Yep. So first I'll start by explaining the difference between a tax deduction and a tax credit. So a tax credit simply is better. A tax credit is a one-for-one saving. So if you somehow qualify for a $1,000 tax credit, you are going to save $1,000 in taxes. Nice. If you qualify for a $1,000 tax deduction, you're only going to save whatever your tax rate is. So for simple math, if your tax rate's 25%, you're only going to save $250 on a $1,000 deduction. Mm -hmm. That being said, let's start with deductions and then I'll get to a credit. So deductions have gotten trickier over the years because uh, in 2017, tax laws changed to where the standard deduction, 86% of people now take the standard deduction. And for round numbers, a single person is going to take about 15,000 in standard deduction and married filing jointly is going to be about 30,000 and your itemized deductions. That's when we talk about deductions, that's what we're talking about. Itemized deductions. And so there is a line item in there for medical and dental expenses. And that's, that's the thing that caregivers need to be aware of possibly for themselves, but also for their parents. So for their parents, if they're not treating their, and when I say parents, you know, I mean any loved one that you're caring sure, for, yeah, right. um, you know, if their parents aren't treated as a dependent for the child, which we'll talk about that in a second, if they're not, then their parents need to be keeping track of all of their medical expenses, which that is the direct ones, like easy ones, like hospital bills, doctor bills, uh, prescription drugs. And that's indirect things as well. That's transportation to their appointments. That is um, installing ramps, installing lifts, installing yep. bars in the house, you know, anything that adds accessibility. Uh, it's long term care insurance premiums. Now, there's a limit to how much each person can deduct. Now, where this gets tricky, and I'm going to try not to get too into the weeds, but there is a threshold on top of that $30,000 standard deduction for married filing jointly. Right. That's what it's I'm also a about. seven and a half percent of your medical deduction or sorry, your medical deductions have to be above seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income. So let's just, let's ignore the adjusted gross income term. Let's just say income. Sure. And so if you have a $100,000 income, you don't get to deduct the first $7,500 in medical costs. Yeah, so you have to pay taxes on that amount, which, I mean, isn't a whole lot of money. It's, I mean, probably, you'll probably pay some around $1,500, I'd say. Right, yep, yep, I'd say that's that's good math. But after $7,500, because people, so just to put it into perspective, if you're actually spending money on long-term care, I mean, you're spending anywhere between 
thirty thousand dollars a year to ninety thousand dollars yeah. a year. Yeah. So I mean, you're going to go over that seventy five hundred dollar threshold very quickly if you're making a hundred k, of course. Easily. So, yep. What, in your opinion, though, like what are some of the most common misconceptions or mistakes that you see when it comes to senior care planning and financial flexibility? So, you know, you've had a lot of good guests on here and I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but um, assuming that it's not going to happen to you, that's that's a main one. But um, I'm not going to talk about that one, although it is it's an important one. I think a common misconception as it relates to tax planning is that you don't have any control over it and that you are you know, taxes are taxes, they're just going to happen. And that's true to an extent, but there are things that you can do ahead of time yeah. to lower it. And the other thing is, you know, earlier I talked about getting rid of some of that traditional IRA, paying the tax ahead of time before required distributions get in. One mistake I've seen um, financial advisors make with their clients even is converting all of those um IRAs before they reach a certain age. I actually don't like that because like you said, at a certain point, if you use it, if you have long-term care costs, those are huge deductions. Right. So it makes sense to leave some money in those 401ks, IRAs that are going to be taxed someday. It makes sense to leave some in there because at some point you'll be able to offset the taxes that would be owed with the medical deductions great point that you'll have and you know on top of that if you if you hopefully never need it for long-term care expenses there are still ways to lower the tax if you're charitably inclined there's qualified charitable distributions so that's one of the mistakes i see is like going too far with it and trying to front load all of your uh taxes and leaving nothing in traditional IRA source. What do you feel? How do you feel about like trusts? Do you work or do you have any, any advice on how people should approach maybe doing an irrevocable trust to try to shield some of their assets um, when they need to apply for Medicaid or anything like that? And also, does that have any bearing on the amount of money that you pay in taxes if you set up a trust? Yes. And I'll, I'll admit Costa, that gets a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I, understand. No, I, I like okay. to do, def- I like That's to okay. defer to uh, to long term care planning attorneys on that sure. one, but you know, no I'll worry, give there, you. There's only ten of us in the country, so it's not <laughs> a big right. deal. Either. I know what that word means, so it's all good. <laughs> That's right. I I understand, and uh, you know, it's. I'll give you an example though. Sure. Had had someone that worked with where husband was diagnosed with a rare disease, mm-hmm. where at some point he was going to need full 100% care, yeah. wife uh, was perfectly healthy. And the they did not have a lot of assets. Um, mm-hmm. And so what we proposed with a um, an attorney was finding a way to, it's called a uh, in-marriage quadro uh, court-ordered. It's like getting divorced without getting divorced. Nice. And it moved the assets that were in his name to her name. Now, I think uh-huh. another way of doing that would have been to go to a uh, to go to an irrevocable trust. That is right. a, a good point though. Whenever you talk about trusts and long-term care planning and uh, Medicaid strategies, it's irrevocable trusts. Revocable right. trusts don't help you in that right. regard. You basically an irrevocable trust, you're kind of losing control of the assets. And that's the only way you'll ever qualify for any of those things. And, um, and now there's talk. a trade off. There's a, there's a cost to all those things. But in this case, it was going to save that couple, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, and we have some good episodes on people that do Medicaid planning that we talk specifically about the different vehicles like irrevocable trusts and living wills and things like that. And, you know, medical directives, power of attorney, stuff like that. But Scott, many of our listeners are planning for their own retirement or helping their parents with this process. What are some actionable tips on how to approach retirement planning and financial independence? Yep. So 
actionable tips. Number one is unless you're driving right now, listening to this, get into your calendar right now and put something in your calendar, 30 minutes to think about this stuff. Because if you don't put it in your calendar, you're going to listen to this and say, yeah, I really need to get to that. Make it urgent, put it on the calendar and spend some time to think about it. The next yeah. thing, once you've done that, is really get clear on where you currently sit. What do you spend in a year? What do you make in a year? What are your assets? What do you own? What are the different types of assets that you own? And you know, specifically, what I see is, especially as people uh, earn more money, they start to lose track of how much they actually spend. And so I want you to get granular with this. I don't want you to be, I don't want you to guess. I want you to figure out, I use an app. I use the Mint app, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. I've used it a long time. Um, so I have all my expenses going back 10 years. You, you may not have that, but you can use your bank account to look how much money has gone out over the last 12 months. Spend an hour figuring that out because that's one of the biggest drivers of whether or not you're going to have a good retirement. And like I said, don't, don't guess on it. Get granular. Don't be generous with it. Be conservative with it. Sure. And once you've done that, you'll have a little clarity on what you spend. Now you can start to look into, hey, if we have a long-term care event. How much is that going to cost? And do we have the money to cover it? Yeah. And do we have sure. the money to cover I actually... Uh... You might think this is rather strange, but I use a QuickBooks file for our personal income uh, I love expenses. It. So I, instead I of love know, it. usually you have small businesses and medium sized businesses that use QuickBooks, which I use for, for the business aspect as well. I have a different yep. company file, but I just thought, you know, I really am familiar with this accounting software and I enjoy it. Uh, and it communicates with my banks. So yeah, I and just started you- using it. You're you're a sick individual if you love accounting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I mean, it's it's all I, good. I really, Whatever works. Yeah. No, I I really I I believe believe me. I I actually really love accounting software. It's rather strange. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with I'm with you then. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you've talked about the importance of having an intentional plan. Yes. Could yep. you explain what this means and how our listeners can go about creating their own intentional financial plans? Yes. So everybody has a plan. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you don't, if you haven't been intentional about it, then your family members will have a plan for you or the state will have a plan for you. So when I talk about an intent or the IRS will have a plan for you, when I talk about an intentional plan, I mean, I want you to actually think about what you want retirement to look like. Um, and by the way, we don't always get the opportunity to make that happen, but I found a lot that I would be helping someone retire and they would be financially ready to, they would be retiring, not because they wanted to necessarily, but because they hit a certain age or maybe their job forced them out and they had never really thought about what am I going to do in retirement? So I see it way too often where Someone retires, they then spend their days watching the news. They sure. spend their days scrolling Facebook because they all didn't know what ideas. very terrible <laughs> ideas. Um, all because they didn't, you know, actually plan out. You know, open a document on your computer and just type out what would a perfect day look like for me in retirement? What would a perfect right. week look like? How That's many trips point. throughout the year do I want to take? Like spend the time to actually do that. So few people do. They kind of just say, oh, not going to work every day. That's going to be great. (laughs) And for a few weeks, for a few months, for most people, it is. But at a certain point, there hits that boredom point and lose some purpose. So um, that's a big aspect is to, to actually get intentional about what retirement looks like. And then, you know, the financial side of it, comes next. Mm-hmm. So before we wrap up, will you tell us about Verify Financial and how it's uniquely positioned to help families with their financial planning? Yeah, thank you. So uh, Verify started here in 2023 after spending five and a half years at a retirement planning firm. And I started Verify because I kept running into people who were 
DIY investors, or maybe they even had a friend or someone that managed their money, but they had questions about financial planning. They had questions about tax planning, and they couldn't find people who would just give the advice, give the guidance without requiring them to move their money. And so I wanted to provide that option to DIY investors where I can be an impartial third party, give them guidance and connect them to people that, uh, you know, for instance, if someone needs long-term care insurance, I can connect them to people that sell long-term care insurance. If they need their wills, maybe a trust, their power of attorney is done. I can connect them and I'm not financially incentivized to sell them a product. Um, I'm just paid to give them a really strong financial plan. And since I don't manage investments or sell insurance, I have to double down on financial planning. So I hit go really deep with my clients. I keep kind of a limited number of clients um, over time so I can really go deep with them. That's amazing. So we always like to end the show with a call to action. For anyone who is just starting to take financial planning for long-term care and retirement seriously, what are the first steps that they should take? So the first steps are to get real with what and get get real and get clear on what the costs might look like. So you mentioned the high costs earlier. I, I have a resource for your listeners. It's at verifyfinancial.com backslash gift, where it's a five step process to estimate their future long term care costs. Now, a lot of your listeners probably know what it costs today. But when you think about what it's going to cost in 10 years, 20 years, 30 Mm -hmm. years, it can be scary, but also it doesn't need to be quite as scary as it needs to be or as it sounds once you run the numbers and see what that's going to look like. You can't plan for something if you have no earthly clue what it actually might look like. So the first easy actionable step is go use my free resource to find out what your future long-term care costs could look like. 